everybody. Welcome to Recovery Alive. We are so excited that you are here. We feel like God is going to do something amazing in your life today. I just believe that with all my heart. So I just want to let you guys know that we want to make sure that this is a safe place for you to find hope and healing. We invite you to share this, start a watch party. Make sure that you're letting people know that this truly is a place where God is doing some amazing work. Let everybody know about it. We love you guys. As you could have chosen anything to be doing right now, but you decided to kind of hang out with us. So we're so, so glad that you did. Enjoy this service and God bless you. these folks here. We just appreciate your service so much. And would the rest of you all stand right now? We thank you guys so much. My name is John. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with codependency and anger and avoidance and things like that. This is Recovery Alive. We think it's the best place to be on a Friday night, and uh, so excited that you guys are here. If you came in, you need just some hope you need a time to just kind of lay your heart open and maybe you don't even believe that there's a higher power. It's okay. You can belong before you believe here at Recovery Live. Amen. I don't know what, uh, what you're struggling with, but God does. That's what we believe. And I wonder if you just close your eyes, if you don't mind, and just bow your heads. And I just want to pray over their time together. Father, I just thank you, God that we have you, we have a, a great hope. We worship you because you're worthy, God. And we worship you because we believe, help our own belief, God. We just want to take a deep breath. We want to allow ourselves right now to just find our rest in you. We're just going to worship you, even in the storm, in the difficulty, in the struggles. We just want to give you this time. It's so hectic. Life is just crazy. We just give you this time. We say, God, have your way. Have your way in Jesus' name. Same God, never fail. 
To praise when our heart is heavy. Amen? It's a choice. It's tough, man. <laughs> it's tough when you're struggling. It's easy to praise God when things are going good, but man, it's hard. But you know, I, this song has been huge for us here lately because just been having people talking about how like the comfort that they've found isn't that necessarily that God is going to take them out of the fire, but he's going to be with them in the fire of their struggle. Amen? And that's what we believe. That's what we believe. Should I fall in the space between? 
that we have. Can we just praise God in here? You know, listen. You know, in recovery, it's not about the process. It's not about the 12 steps. We use a process to help us move and grow in our relationship with God. It's not about even the people here. It's fantastic that other people can hold us accountable, but really it's about the power of the Holy Spirit who can do in us what we can't do in ourselves. It's about what the Holy Spirit in us, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, can do in a life that's surrendered to Him. And I don't know, man, I just feel like, I, mean, I, don't even, I, I know, I don't even feel like, I know that people are just going through it. I just want you to believe right now that God is taking you through some of this stuff for a reason. There's a purpose behind your pain. He's refining us. He's refining us. Praise you, God. Is where you meet us. Take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a living 
sacrifice for you. You're fine, you're finer. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purified to stay whatever you desire. Lord, here in my life, I want to be tried by fire. Purified to stay whatever you Lord, hear my life. If your glory wants to come here, let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it a place, and we'll be a living sacrifice for you. You refine, you refine her. I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you say whatever you desire, Lord here's my life, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you say whatever
praise you. Praise you. It's a hard prayer, but whatever it takes, God, we, we want to be what you created us to be. Just take all the rest of it. We just surrender ourselves to you again. We surrender, we surrender, we surrender. We're rebels who are laying down our arms before you, God. We just take it, just take it. We want you, we want more of you. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. We worship you. You're worthy in this place. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, hey. Hey, find somebody, give a head bump, a knuckle bump, elbow, kick somebody in the knee before you're seated here. Raising hope from the dead. <laughs> Best place to be on a Friday night. There you yeah. go. Yeah. My name is Emily. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus, and I struggle with codependency and self-worth. And I'm going to speak just a moment about Angel Tree. It's tied to the video that you guys just saw. And you talk about a church that reaches out to their community. That truly is temple. And when we're done with the power group tonight, or the large group, and we dismiss to go to our people groups, if you are interested in being the hands and feet of Jesus and showing not just a child hope, but their parents are being ministered to. So what it, with, you know, the parents that are incarcerated, that are in prison, they're not able to give. They're not able to do. We're going to fill that void. This is much bigger than giving a gift to a child that's in need. So when we're done with large group, come up and get a tree, get a little angel, and Kat and Candy are going to be up here because we have to keep up with them. It'll be a sign to you. But that just, that's a blessing. Be, be a blessing and you will have a blessing. And I also want to mention when we're done with large group, if this is your first time here, welcome. We're glad that you came and joined us. We want you to fill out a connect card. They're in the little seat back pockets in front of you. And if you're online, we'd like for you to fill out the um, virtual online card. We just want to be able to see that you are here and um, welcome you back, hopefully. 
So when we are done with large group, if it is your first time, we have a little class called um, New Beginnings, and it's done by a couple. They'll just go over Recovery Alive and how it works here and what we're all about and um, just give you the informational download. Also, speaking of a church that truly cares about their community, come see what this Jesus is all about, what this hope is all about. If you're new to recovery and you're kind of thinking, this is really weird, come see us on Sunday. It's even better. <laughs> <laughs> we have a 9 o'clock and a 1045. Come join us. No, it's awesome. It's awesome praise and worship, awesome message. Um, it's just good to be here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. So come see us on Sunday if you get the chance to do so. And speaking of Sunday, if you took a shoe box, that's another ministry that we're doing. Those are shipped overseas to um, different countries, different places. They will bless children that may have never had a toy at all. So if you took a shoe box and you filled it up with your presents and your gifts, please bring it back Sunday morning. We're going to have a celebration um, and rejoice and pray over those boxes, but they are due Sunday. So are you last minute folks? It's your moment. <laughs> All right. What's up, y'all? My name is Gary. I am a grateful believer in Jesus, and I struggle with codependency. Hi, Gary. What's up? I'm so glad to see all y'all. All y'all. All right. We're about to take up our offering um, and to do the social distance thing. The ushers are going to go walk up and down the aisle. So if you would make sure all your stuff's clear, you know, so they can walk right through and not trip, unless it's TJ. But, um... And you can just drop it in the bucket as they walk by. Um, if you will join us, we'll, let's bow our heads and let's pray and give thanks for this offering. Uh, Father, we are so grateful to be here tonight, Lord God. We look forward to what you're doing in this place, Lord. Um, we're so grateful, Lord, to be a part of what you're doing in this world right now, Father. That your hand is on our lives, Lord God. That you're healing us, Lord. That you're bringing change to our lives, Lord, so that we can represent you in this world. And let them see the hope and the healing that we have through you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Father, we want to be that light. Lord, as the world grows darker, Father, we want to burn brighter. We want to burn for you, Lord. We want to burn so that they'll know the truth, the healing and hope that we have in your holy name. And Father, this offering, we just ask you to bless it, Lord God, and multiply it. And help us to use it, Father, to bring your word to a lost and dying world. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you guys excited to be in the best place on a Friday night? We've got to wake up a little bit up ahead. Yeah, all right. It's funny, like, crowds have personalities sometimes. It's a little sleepy up in here. I don't know what's... It was a little rainy yesterday. Folks are a little... A little tired, a little sleepy. The youth usually can get us woke up. Are you guys okay over there, youth? Oh. That's, uh, everybody's sleepy. Okay. My name is John. I'm still John. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. And uh, we are on step three. This is our second week of step three. And uh, step three says we made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God. And uh, step one is about realizing that we're powerless and that our lives are unmanageable. That's a reality. It's a reality. And that, uh, that step one idea is that weakness is a reality. It's not something we decide. It's not something that we choose. It's weakness is a reality. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Each one of us is weak. But the good news is God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Amen? And so then step two has to do with this idea that there is a power greater than myself who can restore me to sanity, who can restore my life to sanity. And that takes humility. And the weakness is a reality. Humility is a choice. We make a decision to humble ourselves, and he lifts us up. And some of you are moving along that process. You're going to hear a testimony tonight of somebody who's moved along that process, who realized the weakness of her situation and the difficulty that she was facing. She humbled herself, and you're going to hear how God lifted her up. Step three is this idea of surrender, that we make a decision to, to actually turn our will and our life over to God. And even though kind of turn our life over is a one-time decision, turning over our, 
our will is a daily, moment-to-moment -moment decision. Amen. It's hard, isn't it, to turn your will over every moment, every moment. And so that's what step three is about. All who call on the name of the Lord, we believe, will be saved. And tonight, you're going to hear an incredible testimony of somebody who called out to God. God answered her in her darkness. I don't want to give her testimony for her. So without any further ado, I'm going to bring Tasha up here. Tasha is going to introduce tonight's testimony. Let's give it up for Tasha. Hey, everybody. My name is Tasha. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus, and I struggle with the effects of past trauma and codependency. So I just want to tell you a little bit about this amazing lady that's telling her story tonight. I have watched her grow as an individual and on her walk with Jesus. She is brave and courageous, and she has fought so hard to get where she is today, and I've had the honor to walk with her through her recovery journey. I am so, so proud of you, Erica. So everybody, just help me welcome Miss Erica Gardner. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Psalms 25.5. Good evening, everyone. My name is Erica. I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with anger, control, trust, and past abuse. I am the second oldest, one of four children. So growing up in my house always, always seemed like total chaos. Most of my early years of life, I hardly remember seeing my mom as she was in and out of hospitals dealing with her own past trauma. And I hardly remember seeing my dad as he was always busy working two jobs. Due to the stress of working two jobs, it always seemed that my dad was always angry and always tired. I also noticed that my older sister took on the role of mom to compensate for the time that my mom wasn't there. I learned very early in life that if you wanted anything in life, you had to depend solely on yourself to get it, and that you had to work twice as hard to get it. In a home of six, as you can imagine, we were poor. Thankfully, we never went without food, but I will tell you that I could go the rest of my life without ever eating beans and cornbread ever again. When it came time for the new school year or Christmas, I would always get really excited not for the toys, but because that meant that I would get new clothes and not hand-me-downs. Spoiled was definitely not in any of our vocabularies. I was very active in sports from an early age, and I only remember my dad missing two games. Although he worked all the time, he made it a priority to be at every single game. My mom, on the other hand, didn't get to make it to as many games as my dad did, which I believe is where my self-worth issues had begun. Being one of four children, there was the oldest sister who seemed to make the rules. There was the younger sister who was daddy's girl. And then there was my younger brother who was mama's boy, which left me with no role other than the second oldest. I often related most to the middle child and other families because I too felt out of place in my own. I was never as smart as my other three siblings. And while they were all taking all honors classes, I stuck to the basic classes because I knew that I would not succeed if I took honors, which wasn't acceptable in my house. Feeling out of place and not as smart made me, led me to believe that I was never good enough. There was, however, one thing that I excelled in, and that was sports. I played, I put blood, sweat, and tears, literally, into every sport that I played because that seemed to be the only time that my parents let me know how proud they were of me. I continuously chased a sense of fulfillment from a sport instead of God. I never wanted to be home because it was toxic. With a dad who was always angry and a mom who was emotionally unstable, home never felt like a home should. Too many times, I witnessed my parents fighting and arguing, which I feel is what brought on my anger issues. But we did go to church, though. 
And even though fighting might take place at home before we left or in the car on the way to church, when we pulled up, everyone would put on their Sunday hats and acted as if everything in life was perfect. This taught me to always hide my true identity to the world. I believed in God, but I was never taught about an intimate relationship with him. I thought that all I needed to do was go to church on Wednesdays and Sundays to get to heaven, and that would make me, that was good. I thought that when I got angry, all I needed to do was lash out in order to be heard, that when I was sad, I was to stuff it down and be tough, and that when someone hurt me, I didn't need to let it phase me, and that I was just overreacting. I was never taught the right way to fight my battles. Two weeks after I graduated high school, I found out that I was pregnant, and there went my dreams of playing college basketball. While all of my friends were packing up and leaving for college, I was contemplating having an abortion. Do I throw away my college scholarship and my dreams of playing college basketball to become a mom, or do I have an abortion and chase after the one thing that I put my blood, sweat, and tears into, the only thing that my parents ever let me know they were proud of me in? But I decided not to have an abortion, and I trusted that even though I was only 18, everything would work itself out somehow. But boy, was I made to feel like I made a huge mistake. I will never forget those five words that came out of my father's mouth. I'm disappointed in you. And not only did I hear them from my dad, but I heard them from my granddad as well. You see, I never seemed to have the right friends, and I never seemed to make the right decisions. So here I was thinking that just for once, I was making the right decision in my life by keeping this baby, only to be told that I was a disappointment. I was shaken. I was angry and full of shame and guilt. I had zero confidence in myself at this point, and my self-worth was way out the window. My chaotic childhood transitioned into my early adulthood, which caused me to stay in a toxic relationship with a man who drank excessively and then abused me as a result of the alcohol. I spent so long being angry and blaming myself, but I just knew he loved me. That's what they all say, right? I finally worked up the courage and I left that relationship and I fell into promiscuity and partying. After all, I never got to party like any of my friends did because while they were partying, I was having a baby. I had to grow up quick. I was not given a choice. Being promiscuous and partying led to a ton of bad choices, which consisted of me driving while intoxicated, sleeping in my car as a result of my alcohol intake, or staying at random houses as I had blacked out. I never realized then how much God was protecting me through these years of my life. Eventually, I found my way back to Temple, and I tried my hardest to be there on Sundays. Being a single mom paid off, though, because in 2013, I was awarded a scholarship to attend the Passion Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. I heard Chris Tomlin for the first time, and the song he was singing was White Flag. These lyrics struck my soul, and I found myself sobbing in my seat. We raise our white flag, we surrender all to you. We raise our white flag, the war is over, love has come, your love has won. That night, January 5th of 2013, was the night that I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I am trusting you to lead me through it. I met a guy who was a key element in helping me get my life right with God. He taught me how to pray, and he showed me how to understand the Bible. It's like my eyes had been opened, like someone took the blinders off, and for the first time in my life, I could feel God's presence as he wrapped his arms around me. I came back from passion on fire for God, and I prayed for strength to leave yet another toxic relationship with a man who I thought I was going to marry one day. A few months passed, and I had lost contact with my friend from passion, and I relapsed. I fell back into partying and getting wasted any and every time my son would leave to go to his dad's house. The last time I blacked out, I don't know how I got home, nor do I recall who I was with or what happened to me the night before. You see, I was, putting, I was seeking guidance, fulfillment, and truth from a man instead of God, which got me nowhere except in a relapse. A few weeks go by, and I got a call from my OBGYN to tell me some not-so-good news. And after treatment, I decided that I needed to change permanently, that my son deserved better than what I was giving him. He deserved a mom he could be proud of, and I wasn't her. A few days after I made that decision to change, I had lost my full-time job, and I was at a very low place in my life. My part-time job wasn't paying the bills, nor was it putting groceries in my fridge. 
And I had to send my son to stay with a friend of mine for a few days just so that he could eat. And so I had time to apply for government assistance. If you've never had to send your child somewhere to live for a few days so they could eat, you're very blessed. I was too prideful to let anyone know that I needed help, and I was too embarrassed for people to see me struggle. As stated before, I was raised to believe that if you wanted anything in life, you had to depend on yourself to get it. I had never, ever felt like less of a mom until that happened. But I did not give up, and I did not lose hope that something good was going to come of this. Since my job was no longer in the way of me attending church, I began to attend every single time the doors were open. I even joined the temple choir. It was one Sunday afternoon in choir practice that we were sharing prayer requests, and I raised my hand and I asked for prayers and finding a full-time job. And little did I know that God had something up his sleeve, something bigger than I could have ever imagined. I was approached that day by a new choir member who stated she was a supervisor at DSS in Wayne County, and she had a vacancy on her clerical team. Within three weeks, I became an employee of the government, and that was only the first blessing that God had for me. I worked there for three months, and I got promoted, and I then found an adorable three-bedroom home that I could afford on my own for my son and I. I got off government assistance, and I started my life over, only this time I was more confident. I met a man who I quickly fell in love with. I met him here at Temple, and he loved the Lord more than anything. We both had a lot of baggage to work through, but we eventually got married and we started our lives together. I had no idea how much personal baggage I was bringing to our marriage. The walls that I had built up towards everyone around me, the lies that I had told myself over and over again, the anger that festered inside me from growing up with an angry father and an emotionally unstable mother, the shame and guilt that I had for not treating my body as his living temple. the feeling of never being good enough and that I could never make the right decisions. I was a prisoner in my own mind and it began to tear away at my marriage. Two years into our marriage and I was ready to call it quits. But through counseling, it was explained to me that I experienced a lot of loss in my past and that there is a grieving process that comes with every loss. I was too busy trying to be the God of my own life that I was oblivious to the fact that I needed to grieve and I needed to heal. I was hurting so much that I chose to hurt others instead of healing, and that saying hurting people hurt people was very evident in my life. So I began the process of grieving and healing on my own, not once asking God for help with it. And once again, I was trying to be the God of my own life. My marriage seemed to be getting better though, but little did I know that Satan had put the blinders back on my face. Only this time, it's if they were solid steel. 14 months ago, I was ready to end our marriage, again, I had emotionally disconnected from my husband and became a prisoner once again in my own mind. No, my husband is not perfect, but he deserved better than me. He deserved a wife who was emotionally stable. He deserved a wife who didn't fly off the handle and rage at every little thing. He deserved a woman who had it all figured out. Those were just some of the lies that I was filling my head and my heart with. And although some of them were true, I needed to stop telling myself that he deserved a better woman and I just needed to become that better woman. Step three states that we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God for all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, Romans 10, 13. I decided that it was time for me to do this the right way. On September 6, 2019, I decided that I deserved true healing and freedom from my hurts, habits, and hangups. So I went to recovery for the first time. That night, I felt so much love, yet so much conviction, and I was so eager for freedom and change that I even signed up for a step study that night, not knowing that a month later, I would begin my recovery process. But this time, there was nothing stopping me, because this time, I asked God to lead me each step of the way. Father, lead me, because I can't do this alone, became my new life motto. I started to learn through my step study process that it's okay to trust people, and that God will send the right people to you, and you will know instantly that they are a safe place. It taught me that if I wanted something in life, I do not have to depend solely on myself to get it, because I have a team behind me supporting me and encouraging me each step of the way. My step study taught me that letting down my walls actually felt good, and that it wasn't as scary as I always imagined it would be. 
God used this to show me that I am a hot mess, but I'm his hot mess, and he loves me all the same. One principle that stuck with me the most was voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects. Over the last 14 months, I have worked on my anger and trust issues, and too many times I have had to ask God to get me out of my own way so that he could work in me and through me. And I've seen him do just that. Recovery is hard, and no doubt it's messy. You bring back the worst parts of yourself only to be healed through the saving power of Jesus Christ. Seven months into my recovery journey, I heard a woman speak, and she made a statement that hit me like a two-by-four to the head. Don't be afraid to recover out loud. It was at that moment that I realized that I still portrayed to others that everything in my life was perfectly fine, that I had an amazingly perfect and happy family, and that we didn't struggle. I realized that I still had my walls up to the world, so I decided from that point moving forward that I would recover out loud too. I began to write posts on social media about how broken I was, about how I struggled with anger and control issues, and to this day, my inbox stays flooded with random women reaching out to me, stating that my message of hope touched them and made them want freedom like what I was finding. Romans 5, three through five, states that we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And ind endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our co confident hope of salvation. But this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. I was so focused on freedom that nothing, not one thing, could keep me from a meeting. I graduated my step study with 100% attendance because I knew that if I did miss one meeting, Satan would use that to get me off track. I now serve in our Recovery Alive ministry as a process group leader. And there is nothing that I love more than seeing other women overcome their hurts, habits, and hangups like I have. Don't let me lie to you, I do still get angry and I still struggle. But something that I learned on my recovery journey is that my struggles do not define me. They happen to refine me into the woman that God wanted me to be. My husband and I are closer now than ever, and I fall in love with him more and more every single day. My children are a lot happier now because they see a mom who is happy and not bitter and angry. My friendships have blossomed into something amazing, and I know that I always have a safe place to vent, laugh, cry, or just sit at. My relationship with my mom that was once broken and non-existent has turned into something beautiful and not a week goes by that we don't talk or see each other. But the relationship that developed the most was the one with my Heavenly Father. I can't go a day without talking to Him. And my favorite worship times are when it's just me and Him alone in my car every day, one-on-one, -on -one as I am singing, crying, venting, laughing, or just sitting in his presence as a song comes across the radio. There's a song called Waymaker, and these lyrics run through my mind on repeat. Even when I don't see it, you're working, and even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. So to the newcomer, or to anyone that feels stuck in their recovery journey, if I could leave you with just a few things that helped me on my recovery journey. Number one, I'm proud of you. Because by coming tonight, you made that first decision to step towards freedom and healing. So be proud of yourself. Number two, you might not know or see how God is working in your life right now, but one day you will. So don't give up and don't lose hope. Number three, talk to people. You might think that you're keeping yourself safe by putting up walls, but what you're actually doing is shutting out the right people who will help you recover. Number four, when you don't feel like coming to RA, come anyways. You may not know it, but you may be just the one person that someone else needs to see on a Friday night. You might be the reason someone else has hope. Number five, ask for phone numbers and use those numbers. And be vulnerable, and even if you don't ask for numbers, give your number out. People love to see that other people are vulnerable. And last but not least, get involved. Join a process group and serve. Each person was given a gift, even if talking is your only gift. I know that Tasha is always welcoming new members to her First Impressions team. God did not give you a gift for you not to use it. 
You can't keep it unless you give it away. And for too long, anger and bitterness controlled my life. I learned that something or someone will have first place in your heart. But when you find your identity in the one who created you, it'll give you a whole new perspective. So what or who have you allowed to define you? Because your identity will be tied to whatever or whoever you give your heart to. My name is Erica. This is my story. If you could stay standing. The thing that just kept hitting me over and over was, and she said it several times, let down your walls, let down your walls, let down your walls. That just kept, kept repeating in my mind, and I had a thought. Um, I've got four daughters, so pray for me. Um, but I just had this image of, of a little girl, and it and, you know, happened with all of them. I don't know if you're a parent, and uh, I was just thinking one of my little girls getting like a splinter in her hand, and me going up there with a big old needle, right? And she's like, ooh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, that'd be great. Love that. Please do that. What, what do they do? Don't, yeah, just get away from me. And I'm trying to help her, right? I'm trying to heal her. I'm trying to get this thing out, and she doesn't, she doesn't know that in order for me to start her healing process to help her, to kind of help her get this, this thing out of her that's causing so much pain, I actually have to hurt her, right? And that's what I think a lot of us are faced with. We're, we're faced with this, this choice where like, it's protected us for so long to keep up a wall and say, just no, 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 don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. All of us are carrying these wounds. We carry these wounds, these wounds of worth. We're going to be talking about this all month, these worth wounds. I'm disappointed in you. You don't measure up. You're not good enough. You carry around these wounds that, that people have caused, that you have believed, that you tell yourself, that you're that you're worthless, that you're, you're not good enough, that you don't measure up, and, and, and you put up the walls and you just don't want anybody to get near you, you don't want anybody to touch you because you just are feeling like, man, they're just going to prove that I, I, I'm just not good enough. And tonight I, I'm just asking you to just consider letting down those walls. I know it is terrifying. You're not doing that. You're not letting down those walls for me. You're not letting down those walls for the people in this room. You're letting those walls down so that God can come in and heal you. Do you want to be set free? Do you want to be healed? It's your choice tonight to begin to lay down your walls. You put on a good smile. Maybe even in church, you're at your very, very best and your most fake. I'm fine. I'm great. But inside, man, you are just miserable in pain. And I'm just asking you to just consider just letting down your walls tonight. In a minute, Erica is going to sing a song called King of the World. And I want you guys, each one of you, to consider this crossroads of you've been doing it the same way. You've been doing it the same way. You've just, you've just been protecting yourself. You've just been trying to be strong enough, and it's just not working. It's not working. Your relationships suffer. Your relationship with God is suffering. And I just love it if you just close your eyes with me and just bow your heads, and you just surrender. Would you just think about surrendering? God has a hold of your hand, and he's saying, let me, let me get that out of you. Let me heal you. Let me take care of this wound. Let me let me, let, me, let me add that pain that you won't let anybody touch. Let me have it so that I can heal you, that you can be free. What if tonight you said yes? You don't even know what that necessarily looks like, but you just bend a, a knee and just say, God, I, I'll, I'll, I'll surrender. I give up. Have at it. I don't care whatever it takes. Whatever I've got to go through, I'm ready to face my pain, to let down my walls and have my healing. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's something inside of you that you've just been protecting, that you don't want anybody to touch, you've been trying to do it on your own, and you're, you're, even now you can feel the fear. 
The enemy is wrestling with you. He's, it's push-pull right now. You know that the only way to get better is to surrender, but you just are so scared. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, I'd love for you to just take one step because I just want to pray for you. Nobody else is looking around. There's a wound inside of you you've been protecting. There's something going on inside of you that you haven't, you haven't let people really fully deal with or, or you haven't let God into your pain. Would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. There's something I've been protecting. There's a wall that's been up in my life. There's hands everywhere, yeah. You're dealing with something. Maybe it's something secret. Maybe it's something that you maybe you just kind of started to talk about, but you haven't fully gone after. If you raise your hand, or even if you didn't, I wonder if you would come up to this altar and just surrender. Just say, God, I'm ready to let down my wall. I'm ready to surrender my will. I don't even know necessarily what that looks like. I'm just going to give you my trust. I'm going to put my hand in your hand, and I'm going to let you start to heal my pain and my wound. If that's you and you raise your hand, or even if you didn't raise your hand and, and God's speaking to you to come and surrender your pain to him, your hurt to him, you have some wounds that you're carrying around, and you want God to give you some freedom and some healing tonight, we want to pray over you. I know you're scared, but tonight is the night for you to get the healing that you, that you have been longing for. You've tried it your way. You've tried to keep up your protection in your wall, and it's just kept people out. It's kept healing out. Tonight, let's do this together. It's a safe place to just come and get prayed over. So in a minute, Erica is going to sing. I'd love for you to just come to this altar, and, and we're just going to pray over you. And we're going to believe that God is the king of the world. He's the king of your pain. He's going to conquer your fear tonight. Would you just come right now? Don't let the enemy have his way tonight. As Erica sings, King of the World. Let's pray together. Come to this altar and let's pray. Come on. Hey guys, so glad that you made it to our Friday night recovery alive service. Let's go ahead and close in the serenity prayer. Would you join me? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Give me the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen, amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna start our online people groups here in a few minutes. Hope you can join us for that. The link is on the stream, so make sure you click that link. Guys, I'm so, so excited about what's going on here throughout the week. Make sure that you're sharing what we're doing. Make sure that you're doing watch parties. Um, we're trying to just change this world one more, one more hurting person at a time. God bless you guys, and uh, we'll see you next Friday.